AP European History with Dr. Brofkin. Today we continue to talk about French religious wars. Uh, and a brief summary, uh, in the first part we discussed the beginning of the French religious wars, which started uh, in, the, uh, in the 1562, uh, and they continued to rage until uh, 1598 with the adoption of the uh, decree of Nantes. Uh, Edict of Nantes. So what we've discussed was the beginning of the wars and the escalation of the wars and basically the pattern that was established from the very beginning uh, which is that you have private armies uh, and these private armies are connected with certain geographical areas and with certain political leaders. So the political leaders would be the uh, leaders of the Huguenots which is Calvinists or uh, Prince Conde and the Prince Coligny and that branch of the royal family which would be known as Bourbons uh, and uh, the leaders of the uh, Catholic faction would be uh, brothers de Guise, there were three of them uh, and then one replaced the other and they founded a new organization which could be called the po first political party a religious political party which is called the Catholic League uh, so the new things as we discussed in this war uh, was unlike the chaos of the German peasant war, you actually have organized armies uh, and these armies are led by feudal lords or, or by the dukes and, and the royalty. Uh, so you have a combination, you have popular wrath, which is hatred, uh, which is combined with organized armies. Uh, and, and they do uh, horrible things, uh, you know, massacres, burning of cities and towns and uh, desecrating churches. Uh, this is probably one of the most tragic periods in French history. Uh, the second thing that we've observed is that after fighting flares up, it sort of ends with, with a peace treaty, a dict of toleration is one of them. Uh, and what it does, it basically is a truce, which means it sort of freezes war at where it is right now, uh, depending on who is winning. And that would normally end with a, a toleration, meaning not that in one city people would be peacefully living each other. No, it would actually mean that in a certain towns, which soon will be called uh, les villes de sûreté, uh, that means security towns. They w will be totally uh, Huguenot. Uh, there will be no Catholics there. Uh, and they will have their own churches and, and they will have their own government and it will be all pretty much Huguenot control. Uh, and then, of course, there would be the rest of France would be um, Catholic. So if you look at the map uh, of France at the time, you have a whole lot of dots uh, that are towns that are Protestant. The interesting, important part about it, as opposed to Germany, is that in Germany you have, you have land, you have huge areas, including countryside, that are Protestant. Because if uh, a, a, a duke or, or chose to be Protestant, then everybody in his possessions will be Protestant too. Not so in France. In France, actually, it's the towns that in their majority become Protestant uh, or leaning towards Protestant because towns are where the merchants are and merchants are the ones who like Calvinism because Calvinism let them possible to be a good Christian and make money. So that's the difference in France. The countryside uh, and peasants and conservative landlords, they of course remain Catholic. So you, in a sense, you have a kind of a class division uh, in Marxist terms, which is, which is not uh, so visible in, in Germany. Okay, and finally, the third aspect it, it, that continues to be uh, all along uh, is, especially with the Second War and the Third War, uh, is the uh, interference of uh, foreign powers, uh, which is that they this they send they send troops. I mean, you have uh, uh, the you have uh, Germans who come from Saar and Alsace, and you have the Spanish that come from Belgium, and Elizabeth sends money and support uh, to the Huguenots, Elizabeth of England. So that's basically means for the first time you have what I call international European ideological war, which is a war not for territory, but a war because you support somebody who thinks like you do. So that makes it an ideological war.
So this is the background to uh, the uh, to the next war, uh, which is probably the most famous or infamous or tragic, uh, which is. Uh, 1572-1573, which is associated with the uh, one more attempt to establish peace, and it is known in history as the Night of Saint Bartholomeo. It just happens to be that the events that are going to be happening happened on that night of this saint who has no connection to him. It was on that day, and pretty much in a Christian calendar, any day would be somebody's saint's day. So there's so many of them that it's just a coincidence that it's called that. So here's the background. Basically, uh, uh, it was one more attempt to, of Catherine Medici to uh, establish peace. Uh, and this day was supposed to be the marriage of uh, a young couple. One of them is called is Ma Margaret de Valois, who is uh, Catherine's uh, daughter. She's the sister of uh, the king. Uh, and uh, uh, Prince Conde's son, uh, Henry of Navarre, who will be later known in history as Henry IV of France. So he's a Bourbon, he's uh, from the Protestant family. Uh, his little kingdom is of Navarre, which is between, today Navarre is between a province in Spain, between uh, France and Spain in the in closer to the Atlantic, that, that part of the Pyrenees. Uh, in any case, the, the, the marriage is supposed to establish peace uh, between the two warring factions, between the Catholics and the Protestants, and between the two branches, because the, 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 the Bourbons are also of royal blood that dates back to uh, Louis XI. So that seems like a good plan, and, and that would supposed to inaugurate peace. But that doesn't happen uh, because of the conspiracy that is led by Duke de Guise. Uh, so essentially what happens during the ceremony, uh, Prince Coligny is, is seized uh, and brutally murdered in the streets. Brutally. I mean, his, his uh, uh, private parts were cut off and he was naked and they dragged his, his uh, mutilated body through the streets. Uh, but it was not just, it was just the beginning. It was a signal of this conspiracy. And, uh, and, and immediately that night, they started rushing into the homes of the Huguenots, the Protestants, and murdering them. Uh, and Huguenots were quite easy to identify because they all wore black. Uh, in, in fact, uh, this black uh, suit that men dressed into, uh, some people say it sort of remained to the present day. Because before the, the Huguenots, men used to be dressed uh, like women. They had, you know, they had all these embroidery and, and uh, red and pink and silk and all kinds of colors in their attire. Uh, no, it was this modesty of the Protestant that basically put men into black. Uh, and, uh, you know, black suit and the tie remains an official clothing to the present day as, as men's proper clothes. In any case, they were easy to identify because they all wore black. So when you see somebody dressed in black, kill him. Uh, so that's what made it so, uh, so preposterous. In any case, the estimate is that 14,000 people were murdered uh, and then it's, it, it, it spread to other cities and it was actually a mass murder. Uh, on unprecedented scale of people uh, who, whose only fault was that they belonged to a different interpretation of Christianity. Simply different interpretation of Christianity. It's uh, hard to imagine that this kind of barbarism, this mass murder, happened in France, which we usually associate with, uh, uh, with a place of culture and civilization. In any case, uh, this of course starts the new war, and that would be the fourth war, 73-72. Uh, uh, and then something else unexpectedly happens, uh, which is that Charles IX dies. But before he died, uh, his brother Henry, uh, who would be known as Henry III, he is elected king of Poland. And he departs for Poland because he, he doesn't think he'll have a chance to become a king of France because his brother is still young uh, and uh, he, could, he could live for decades. So essentially, uh, Henry goes to Poland and uh, is crowned king of Poland. 
And, and a month and a half after he becomes king of Poland, uh, news comes that his brother dies. And so Henry abandons his kingdom and goes back to France. And then he gets letters from the Pole saying, you have to uh, you know, admit whether you are still a king of Poland or not. Uh, and he doesn't respond. Then he wants to make sure he's first crowned king of France. Uh, so, uh, in, so 1574, uh, it, it all happens. Charles IX dies. Uh, and um, Henry comes back and becomes uh, a king. And that intensifies the war, and this is the next war, and this would be a, a war associated with Henry III and his relationship with uh, the Catholic League. So what was this relationship? Uh, it was a complex one that ended in tragedy too. So Henry III was actually known to be more sympathetic to the Catholics. Uh, and uh, unlike his brother, who uh, Charles IX was actually more leaning towards the, the, the Huguenots. Uh, so, th but this did not make uh, the Catholics happy. In fact, it's the opposite. They started to be much, much more aggressive and much more pushy about demanding total liquidation of any Huguenots anywhere in the country. And of course, that means that the, the the towns of Surete uh, were to be destroyed and all the Huguenots expelled from France or, or killed. So that was too much uh, for Henry. He, he didn't want to. Uh, becoming king, he kind of begins to think of the uh, validity of his kingdom and doesn't want to destroy so many valuable people. Uh, it would be just a continued bloodbath and he, he just kind of is, not that he's particularly for Huguenots, he just doesn't want the war to be raging on and on. He has his doubts, let's put it this way. Now, that actually infuriates uh, Duke de Guise, and this is where you have a most interesting period, is that you have a political party called the Catholic League, begun, begins to publish what, what is known as leaflets. In today's terms, it would be like newspapers or political leaflets that attack the king. Uh, for not for being too soft on the uh, Huguenots, so so it's it's an actual political struggle uh, that that for the conservative force, which is Catholic Church, is supposed to is supposed to support the king. No, this is the time when the Catholic League attacks the king for not being tough enough against the enemies of France and enemies of the Catholic Church. So that kind of pisses off Henry and he becomes more and more. You have the convocation of General Etat in Blois. It's a beautiful town in the Loire Valley and I actually was in this building uh, and, and this is where it all happened. So uh, in Blois, during the uh, convocation of the General Etat, uh, Duc de Guise was murdered. Uh, and, and you could actually go to this room and see and, and how the murderers just rushed out. Uh, he was told that the king wants to see him and he walked into a chamber and then the killers uh, rushed in and, and killed him on the orders of Henry. So basically Henry III kills Duke de Guise uh, because he basically feels that uh, that he has no power. Duke de Guise rules behind his back and commands all the uh, all the forces in the, in, of Catholics, and, and essentially uh, is trying to squeeze him out or make him a puppet that would do what, what he's told to do. So it's a kind of an act of defiance uh, on the part of Henry the uh, Third. Henry the Third is not married, and there was some rumor that he's supposed to marry the daughter of Duke de Guise. Uh, but that sort of didn't happen. Uh, but he's childless. He, he doesn't have a child. And if anything were to happen to him, uh, then the next in line uh, would be Henry of Navarre, who is a Protestant. Now, there's another brother, Duke d'Anjou, but he, uh, the, he dies in battle. He actually is participating in these battles. The last Catholic sort of brother, uh, or the, or the last brother of the uh, Medici's sons. Uh, so he dies too. And that means, in practical terms, that by law, if anything were to happen with Henry III, 
the next person in line to become the king would be a Protestant. That that idea must have infuriated Duke de Guise and all the Catholics because that would be uh, a nightmare. Nevertheless, uh, in uh, 1589, uh, a monk walks into a tent uh, of Henry III uh, hiding a dagger and he kills him uh, with the, if we take expression from the Hamlet, with a bare botkin, which means with a naked knife. He kills him. Henry III is dead, killed by a Catholic zealot or uh, hater. Uh, and that creates the situation the Catholics uh, fear most, uh, which is that Henry of Navarre uh, is a king of France, a Protestant. Uh, and there you have um, a war uh, that begins uh, between um, between the Henrys. And it's called the War of Henrys. Henry uh, the, the Guise and Henry of Navarre. Uh, and the war doesn't go very well for Henry uh, the Fourth, the the Protestant king. It doesn't go very well. He he. Uh, he does control parts of France, but uh, Paris and the center of France are uh, totally Catholic. And, and this is what uh, is attributed to him, uh, this famous phrase, uh, Paris is worth a mass. A mass, of course, is a Catholic service. So what he does, basically, is a compromise. Uh, the compromise is that he agrees to uh, accept to, to convert to Catholicism, uh, but uh, in return, uh, the Protestants would be guaranteed uh, security and and toleration in France, uh, and and that's this compromise is the essence of Edict of Nantes, uh, which would exist for close to a hundred years. Uh, so Edict of Nantes is an edict that grants uh, uh, political and religious uh, toleration uh, and independence and self-rule self to the Protestant towns, uh, Ville de Surité. Uh, but in exchange, Henry uh, converts to Catholicism and, of course, uh, the war ends. It's, it's sort of amazing that with that act, uh, the tumultuous long decades of civil strife uh, ended uh, and Henry becomes king. However, it was not the last murder of this uh, war. Uh, in 1610, uh, Henry IV is killed by a, uh, a Catholic murderer, a zealot. So it's just amazing how many uh, kings were killed and how many by Catholics. In any case, uh, that's, uh, that's the end of the tragic story. Uh, and then the positive side, France begins uh, her glorious age of the 1600s, the 17th century, which would be pretty, pretty good for France. Uh, the time of trouble, at least in France, is over. Don't forget to subscribe and to put your likes. AP European History with Dr. Brofkin.